This is a day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Church Street United Methodist Church proudly presents Rejoice. Good morning and welcome to Rejoice, the weekly devotional program brought to you by Church Street United Methodist Church in Knoxville, Tennessee. My name is Andy Ferguson and I'm pleased to be one of the pastors at Church Street Church. Several years ago, Mother Teresa told this story at the National Prayer Breakfast. She said, one evening we went out and we picked up four people from the street. One of them was in the most terrible condition. I told the sisters, if you take care of the others there, I will take care of the one who looks the worst. So I did for her all that my love could do. I put her in bed, and there was such a beautiful smile on her face. She took hold of my hand, and she said two words only, thank you, and then she died. I could not help but examine my conscience before her, and I asked, what would I say if I were in her place? And my answer was very simple. I would have tried to draw a little attention to myself. I would have said, I am hungry, I am dying, I am cold, I am in pain, or something. But she gave me much more. She gave me her grateful love, and she died with a smile on her face. As Christians, we are called to be grateful. Grateful to God for saving us. Grateful to God for the fruitful earth. Grateful for the work and the fruits of our labors by which we provide for our families. Grateful for the Christian friends who share our lives. This is the season of harvest. At our house, we have been reminding each other about the apple orchards up toward Newport. At church, we've been planning for All Saints Day when we give thanks for the saints who provided the foundation for our own faith. We are already making plans for Thanksgiving gatherings for the families and the friends around, rich tables of food. Can we be grateful? Gratitude being, brings a smile and becomes a gift that we give to others and to God. This morning, we're going to read Paul's opening statement of gratitude to the Thessalonians. Let us begin this season of harvest and thanksgiving with gratitude. As you're finding your Bible and turning to 1 Thessalonians, let's listen as our parish adult choir sings, Taste and See.
go ahead and now turn with me to 1 Corinthians, or 1 Thessalonians rather, uh, beginning with chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians, in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. We always give thanks to God for all of you and mention you in our prayers, constantly remembering before God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers and sisters, beloved by God, that He has chosen you because our message of the gospel came to you not in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction, just as you know what kind of persons we prove to be among you for your sake. And you became imitators of us and of the Lord, for in spite of persecution you received the word with joy, inspired by the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and in Acacia. For the word of the Lord has sounded forth from you, not only in Macedonia and Acacia, but in every place your faith in God has become known, so that we have no need to speak about it. For the people of those regions report about us what kind of welcome we had among you, and how you, re how you turned from, to God from idols, to serve a living and true God, and to wait for His Son from heaven, whom He raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the wrath that is coming. It is God's word for God's people. Would you pray with me? Lord, our creator and sustainer, we come with grateful hearts in this season of harvest. We come grateful for family and friends with whom we enjoy this season, for memories of those, especially the saints among us, who have enriched our lives, for food enough and heat enough and more. We come with deep awareness that all that sustains and enriches life is your gift to us. You have given the food by which we are sustained and the homes which shelter us, the families with whom we celebrate the passing years, and the confidence that you meet us this day and every day. As you have freely given to us, we commit ourselves to share every good thing that has come from your hand. Certainly we will share with those we love but we also commit ourselves to share your blessings with those hungry for food and those hungry for human touch. Grant us eyes to see the unspoken need and the need that appears distant and blurred by our comforts. Grant us hearing to understand the unspoken cry of the lonely in the midst of much celebration so that others may have reason for prayers of thanksgiving, not just at this season of thanksgiving, but all the year long. We pray in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior, who blessed and broke the bread to feed us. Amen. There was a famous monastery which had fallen on very hard times. Formerly, its many buildings were filled with young monks, and its huge chapel resounded with the singing of choir. But now it was deserted. People no longer came there to be nourished by prayer. A handful of old monks shuffled through the cloisters and praised God with heavy hearts. On the edge of the monastery woods, an old rabbi had built a tiny hut. He would come there from time to time to fast and pray. No one ever spoke with him, but whenever he appeared, the word would be passed from monk to monk. The rabbi walks in the woods. And for as long as he was there, the monks would feel sustained by his prayerful presence. One day the abbot decided to visit the rabbi and to open his heart to him. So after the morning Eucharist, he set out through the woods. As he approached the hut, the abbot saw the rabbi standing in the doorway, his arms outstretched in welcome. It was as though he had been waiting there for some time. The two embraced like long lost brothers. Then they stepped back and just stood there smiling at one another with smiles on their faces. That, that, that their faces could hardly contain. After a while, the rabbi motioned the abbot to enter. In the middle of the room was a, a wooden table, scriptures open on it. They sat there for a moment in the presence of the book, and then the rabbi began to cry. And the abbot could not contain himself. He covered his face with his hands and began to cry too. For the first time in his life, he cried his heart out. The two men sat there like lost children, 
filling the hut with their sobs and moistening the wood of the table with their tears. After the tears had ceased to flow and all was quiet again, the rabbi lifted his head. You and your brothers are serving God with heavy hearts, he said. You have come to ask a teaching of me. I will give you a teaching, but you can only repeat it once. After that, no one must ever say it aloud again. The rabbi looked straight at the abbot and said, The Messiah is among you. For a while all was silent, and then the rabbi said, Now you must go. The abbot left without ever looking back. The next morning the abbot called his monks together in the chapter room. He told them that he had received a teaching from the rabbi who walks in the woods, and that this teaching was never to be spoken again aloud. He looked at each of the brothers and he said, the rabbi said that one of us is the Messiah. And the monks were startled by this saying, what could it mean, they asked themselves. Is Brother John the Messiah? No, he's too old and crotchety. Is it Brother Thomas? No, he's too stubborn, set in his ways. Am I the Messiah? What could this possibly mean? They were all deeply puzzled by the rabbi's teaching, but no one ever mentioned it again. As time went by, though, something unusual began to happen at the monastery. The monks began to treat one another with a very special reverence. There was a gentle, wholehearted, human quality about them, which was hard to describe, but easy to notice. They lived with one another as, as, as brothers who had finally found something, and yet they prayed over the scriptures together as those who were still looking for something. Visitors found themselves deeply moved by the, the genuine caring and sharing that went on among the brothers. Before long, people were again coming from far and wide to be nourished by the prayer life of these monks. And young men were asking once again to become part of the community. In those days, the rabbi no longer walked in the woods. His hut had fallen into ruins. But somehow or other, the older monks who had taken his teaching to heart still felt sustained by his prayerful presence. The world in which we live is deeply troubled. Ebola has infected another healthcare worker in this country, or is it more now? It is infecting thousands each week in Africa. Even McGee Tyson Airport has a protocol in place for screening passengers who might show signs of Ebola. The so-called Islamic State is threatening cities in Iraq that Americans shed their blood only a few years ago to save. While the U.S. economy is slowly improving, the economies in our European and Japanese trading partners are slowing down. Demonstrations closer to home in Ferguson, Missouri are continuing on and on and on. In a world that seems torn in every possible direction, what is it that holds the nation and this world together? What is it that keeps this fragmented society from flying apart? What has the power to keep our fears from overrunning our confidence? Well, Paul spoke to the church at Thessalonica in a time when that church was troubled with an internal and external pressure. He spoke at a time when Christian gospel was in its infancy and therefore fragile. At the opening of this letter, he speaks of his gratitude for them. And throughout the chapter, filled with gratitude, he weaves elements of their strength. We should learn from Paul and from the church at Thessalonica we individually and as a nation certainly need to learn from them. Three themes come out in this short passage. These stood as the foundation, holding the young church together in the face of pressure and even persecution. The first element of the foundation was their focus on the gospel. Paul said to them, We know, brothers and sisters, beloved by God, that He has chosen you because our message of the gospel came to you not in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit with full conviction. Too often we lose our focus on the gospel of Jesus Christ and depend instead on the world's measures of success, like success, for example. The world measures any enterprise and judges it successful based on a common set of indicators, economic success, the size of the crowds, the prominence of the people who show up, Paul would object to say that the church should be measured only by its faithfulness to the gospel. 
these other indicators are just window dressing. On August 1, 1970, Lane Guthrie, a commercial airline pilot, decided he had had enough. He had dumped his last load of kerosene into the environment. Holcomb Noble wrote in the New York Times at that time, the airline industry practice was to dump waste kerosene during takeoff or at high altitudes. Airline officials claimed that the kerosene evaporated caused no harm to the environment, but Guthrie did not buy it. He claimed that in peak season, as much as 500 gallons of fuel was dumped every day over his home airport in Miami. So on his 30th anniversary as a pilot, he celebrated by following his conscience. He refused to take off until the waste fuel accumulated from the previous flight was pumped out of his jet. In subsequent flights, he continued his demand, and two months later, he was fired for insubordination. By now, however, he'd become a bit of a cause to be celebrated. Other pilots rallied around him and also refused to dump fuel. Finally, the airline backed down and rehired Guthrie at full pay. And soon the airline industry as a whole ceased the practice of aerial fuel dumping. For wrongs to be righted, the question often is who will lead the way and be the first to pay the price of following his or her conscience. For some people, it means deciding that they have told their last lie or cut their last corner. When we follow our conscience, it just may be that other people will be encouraged to follow theirs. But even if others do not, the day we choose to do what we think is right is a cause for celebration. Guthrie looked beyond the obvious question of keeping the company protocols. That protocol just asked whether he had followed the rule to dump or not. By looking beyond the obvious to the greater environment, he could consider the impact of dumping kerosene into the environment day after day. Looking at the greater impact, he decided to act. With his action, he made a difference. We do the same when we keep our eye on the gospel in our daily lives. The world will only ask if we keep the driving laws as we make our way from home to work or out to run an errand. But the gospel will ask us to see, really see the people we pass along the way. What about their neighborhoods? Are their children cared for during the day? Are their streets safe? The world will only ask if we follow the company policies as we do our jobs. But the gospel will ask us whether our daily work is making a stronger community. The world will only ask if we did no wrong as we dealt with difficult or unattractive people through our day. But the gospel will ask what good we did to those same people. Did we offer mercy? Did we work charity in the places of need? Did we offer Christ? The first element of the foundation was their focus on the gospel. Their leaders helped them to focus on their foundations. The second element of their foundation was their persistence. Paul does not use the word, but he compliments them on keeping the faith through several steps and over time. You know what kind of persons we prove to be among you for your sake. And you became imitators of us and of the Lord. For in spite of persecution, you received the word with joy, inspired by the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and in Acacia. They welcomed Paul and his co-workers and learned from them. And when persecutions came, they persisted. Until the Holy Spirit moved among them, they persisted. And because they persisted, they became an example for the believers in Macedonia and Acacia. They persisted in the gospel. During a Monday night football game between the Chicago Bears and the, the New York Giants, one of the announcers observed that Walter Payton, the Bears running back at that time, had accumulated over nine miles in career rushing yardage. The other announcer, announcer remarked, yeah, and that's with someone knocking him down every 4.6 yards. Walter Payton, the most successful running back ever, knows that everyone, even the best, gets knocked down. The key to success is to get up and run again just as hard. The second element is persistence. The, now, the third element of their foundation was their distinctiveness. 
the world could see the difference between the Christians of Thessalonica and everyone else. As the scripture says, for the people of those regions report about us, what kind of welcome we had among you and how you turned to God from idols to serve a living and true God. As you head to the breakfast table this morning, can anyone tell that you're a follower of Christ? As you pay for your groceries this afternoon at the market, will the checkout clerk notice something different about you and the way you treat them? As you go to work on Monday morning, will your coworkers notice something about you that marks you different from others? Will it occur to each of these that the difference might be Christ? I hope so. We are the Lord's army, not the secret service. We have nothing to hide. Let the church in America be a distinctive presence. Paul asked these young Christians in Thessalonica, he sees evidence in their lives of their faith and faithfulness. What counts as a reason for thanksgiving in our churches? What counts as a reason for thankfulness in the lives we lead? The measuring stick by which we assess the lives of our churches too often looks like the same measuring stick that the world uses, profit, suggest, or the buzz we stir up. Americans are being taught that if something is profitable, it must be true, real, and good, and if it's not, it's without true meaning. Christian friends, we are different from such a measure. Our foundation is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, now let's stop and let's listen as our parish, our parish adult choir again sings for us, Jubilate Deo. I want to invite you to worship with us at Church Street United Methodist Church. We worship on Sundays at 8.30 and 11 a.m. 
We are worshiping at this time in our gymnasium, which is uh, to the breezeway in the middle of the building, and then, then down in, in that direction, there will be ushers there to guide. We invite you to come and join us as we gather for that sacred gathering. Also, we have a midweek communion service. Again, I want to invite you to be a part of communion. I want you to be a part of that. Well, in closing, I'm Andy Ferguson, pastor at Church Street United Methodist Church in Knoxville, Tennessee. I thank you for letting me share this devotional time with you in your home. And now as I go, my wish for you is that you might live each day like out of the corner of your eye. You have just caught sight of God and realize that God is headed your way. Members and friends of Church Street United Methodist Church, your downtown church at the corner of Henley and Main, would like to thank you for joining Rejoice. Please send us your comments and suggestions, and be sure to tune in next Sunday at this same time for Rejoice. <laughs>